Hello, and welcome back to Brentwood Stories. I'm DJ Hess, and I am joined by Dan Sullivan today. Hey, Dan. Hey, how's it going? Hey. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who are you, and what do you do? Well, as you said, hi, I'm Dan Sullivan. Uh, I'm a music therapist and a music teacher on Long Island. I live in West Islip currently. Uh, I've lived in the town of Islip for almost all of my life, and I'm just really happy to be here to talk about music today. Awesome. So why don't we start off with what are some of your hobbies? So outside of music, I feel like I have the standard things that most people do. Uh, sports, unfortunately, <laughs> a little, little too much into sports. Let's go Jets. Let's go Rangers. Let's <laughs> let's cry about the Mets. But uh, obviously, playing a lot of music. I play eight different instruments: all the orchestral, violin, viola, cello, and bass, uh, guitar, electric bass, uh, drums, piano, and I sing as well. Very nice. So, what's your connection to Brentwood? So, my mother was actually born and raised in Brentwood, and uh, my grandparents lived in the Baywood area, sort of just off the southern state, Um, and they moved there in 62, I believe. So, uh, I grew up a lot in that house, so I've, despite being from West Islip, I've had a lot of time in Brentwood through my life. Very nice. So, you talked about uh, being in music, and you're here because you're a music therapist. What got you into music and playing music? So it's really funny. I always was just like, oh, yeah, music's on the radio, whatever. I never really thought too much about it until that age in school. Usually it's around third or fourth grade where they let you try instruments. And desperately so, I was thinking I need to play an instrument. So I was focused towards band instruments, of all things. Uh, I really wanted to play trumpet, because I thought, at that time, I should be like Louis Armstrong. Why not? And they let me try out the, the lip movement for it, and I just wasn't very good at it. And my backup was clarinet, because Squidward on SpongeBob SquarePants plays clarinet. I, ha- I have to try that, too. And I couldn't really do the fingering on that, either. And they said, is there anything else that you want to try? And I had no idea. Those were my two options. And there just happened to be a cello in the room. Okay. So as half a question, I said, cello? And they gave it to me, and I sort of did it fine enough for an an eight-year-old who never really touched it. And I think it's such a funny story of happenstance that whatever teacher was at Manitouk Elementary in West Islip happened to leave a cello in the room, and that's literally set the butterfly effect of 20, 21 years later of where I am today. Very nice. I... Also wanted to do trumpet, but they told me that I am too large of a person, so they handed me a trombone instead. <laughs> I don't think that makes sense. I think they just needed someone who was tall with long arms. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that makes sense. So they lied to you, which is always great. <laughs> yep. So let's go on to, what would you say is your favorite instrument? It's got to be cello and bass. So cello being the first instrument I started, uh, I, I definitely had a love-hate relationship with it growing up. For some reason like everyone in middle school having any distinct hobby almost feels like no one look at me this is the most embarrassing thing i could ever do but as i got older i really just appreciated how beautiful the music was and around ninth grade tenth grade i also picked up bass as well similar range but different strings still read the same music so i hopped into that pretty easily as i got a bit older suddenly i was doing a little guitar and then a little drums and then i found a very cheap pair of drums online and then i was just like i'm already playing four instruments why don't i just segment this into the hopefully a career or hopefully a a something in college so i want to give it a shot seems it worked out (laughs) yeah so for a lot of people who wouldn't know a cello's like i guess a big violin would be a bad interpretation it's not the worst (laughs) it's not the worst so if you're look mentally imaging the four orchestral instruments a violin and a viola look very similar Mm -hmm. it it, they you both hold them by the shoulder and the chin if they look a little off or sort of the same it's fine to confuse the two cello and bass you play on the floor cello you have to sit with and bass is much larger than you have to stand with so if you're never sure just know it's the one where the person is sitting (laughs) yes so now, playing cello and bass, doing that in elementary school, how was it carrying around an instrument of that size oh, as te- a kid? Terrible, terrible. Just kidding. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it, obviously, it was very huge, but they're actually hollow. So even the bass, when I did some of that even as an adult, it's still not that fun to carry around. But it, it's not the worst. 
It's yeah. it's you, you get eyes on you, but it's not the worst to physically carry. I just remember carrying around the trombone was a bit of a nightmare. Well, that's that's full metal. Yeah, so that's gonna be, that's gonna stink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, being like that small, carrying around like the huge trombone because it's just like a normal person sized trombone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like they make kid trombones. They do, I get, they do nowadays, I guess. Uh, they probably do, or to school at that time just didn't have any. Because they do make uh, smaller size cellos, basses, violins, violas. Uh, they usually refer to as quarter size, half size, three quarter, and full. And full is what an adult would play. Um, and there was also eighth and sixteenth for some of them, but I, I've never seen a sixteenth. You, you pretty much have to be two years old for a sixteenth to make sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. So let's go into a bit of your career. So explain to us what is music therapy? So there's a whole clinical definition that every music therapist has drilled into their head. And although it's very applicable in a clinical sense, I like to sort of phrase it in a different way. Music therapy at its basis is using music to solve a non-musical issue or to treat a non-musical issue. Whereas a lesson, the main goal, if I was teaching you cello, your goal is to become better at cello. Where music therapy, the goal can be any wide goal. It could be physical, emotional, social, anxiety management. There's a lot of different things that can be addressed by using music as the medium as opposed to like a talk therapy where you and I can have a conversation and we can let our emotions out that way. Some people have a lot of issue with that. So using the music in an emotional way can help. And it can also help in a physical way. I don't know if you remember it was a few years ago uh there's center Ga- gabriella gifford okay so unfortunately she was a victim uh, of a gunshot wound that struck her head and miraculously she survived but she had to relearn language so part of a therapy that she had was music therapy where music is pro- or rather language is processed in one hemisphere of the brain music is processed in both hemispheres of the brain so using music therapy and lyrical structure and uh, repeated melodies, the more she learned music and vocabulary through the music, she was able to then trick her brain into chaining it into language, where she essentially rewired her brain to learn English again in a hemisphere that isn't supposed to learn English. Interesting. So, yeah, so I guess music does affect a lot more Mm -hmm. since it covers both sides of the brain it can help bring back certain memories or stuff like that as well essentially yes so i I did forget to mention the three biggest populations that usually get worked with in music therapy are children and adults with special needs uh geriatric populations and um mental illness although physical as well so four big populations and obviously gabrielle gifford is one of those in the physical. Uh, for the physical, yeah, yeah, where it's sort of a rewiring of the brain in that sense. But as you mentioned, yes, with uh, recollection, especially with geriatric population, um, it's using music as it exists and how you've learned music throughout your life, even just hearing it. And even if you don't think you've learned quote-unquote music, just the stimulation in certain parts of the brain hmm. can sort of rewire other parts of the brain to remember, oh yeah, it's like this or like that. Almost like when you touch something or see something and then suddenly you get a rush of memories right music is the same way huh that's pretty awesome (laughs) i never thought about music in that kind of way yeah yeah, yeah. uh so let's talk about i guess we talked a little bit about this but why is music therapy specifically important to you and why you think it would be important to the world at large to know more about it i think the biggest thing that helps it out or helps people in general is although it's still a growing field in the way where it in a way it's only really clinically existed for a few decades you can really use a medium that already exists everywhere to help heal you know uh and as a music therapist i want to be able to not only just spread the word about you know what is it what do we do but making it as accessible to as many communities as possible or even to a point where if you're not working with a music therapist you can still use music in a therapeutic setting where someone can just listen to a song and then suddenly they feel so much better. Even teaching self tips to how can we even get further past that. Interesting. So, yeah, I I could see how it would definitely affect a lot of stuff and how Mm -hmm. it can be used in a lot of different ways. As you said, 
a physical sense yeah. or uh, geriatric patients is one that I didn't really think about originally. Yeah, yeah. I, so it's not a population that I work with, but it is a, a population where music therapy thrives. It really, really helps. Wh which population do you more of focus on? So I mainly work uh, with children and adults with special needs most of the time uh, with I'm on the autism spectrum. And that's where I personally feel the most comfortable, and that's where I feel like I thrive in my work. I absolutely adore it, and I couldn't be happier with what I'm doing, truly. Definitely a very noble field. Thank you, thank you. So what are more of your music therapy goals? So as a whole, with the population I work with, uh, there's a lot of goals to be assessed, and truly everyone is different, just like how everyone uh, who experiences autism, they are different. No person with autism is the same. So you do need to assess right from the beginning, but there's a few things to look out for. Uh, common traits for someone with autism, very ordered, rigid in detail, low affects where their facial expression might not match exactly how they're feeling, uh, socialization, and using music as that medium to help bring out the certain kinds of things. I, I can go a little bit deeper. I just want to like rant away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go a bit deeper into that, which I know you've touched on a little bit. Yeah. Where we know that your clients are typically probably more towards the autism spectrum yes. and younger kids. Why would someone use music therapy as opposed to talk therapy and I know you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe if we can get a little more specific into it. Yeah, for sure. So again, applying to sort of how I work with it, you sort of need to be able to have a consistent, smooth, and comfortable back and forth of a dialogue like we are right now to be able to thrive in a talk therapy setting. And obviously that's when people hear therapy in some way, that's what they think about, right? Yes. But music... I can talk, I can sing, the other person can talk, can sing, but it's the musical element that sort of drives the back and forth. So building off of music therapy, there's also concepts of play therapy, where you don't need to know a whole lot about it, but the biggest things to understand are parallel play and shared play. Mm -hmm. Parallel play is when two people are just observing a space together, where I might be playing piano and the client I'm working with could just be off in the other corner beating a drum. That's parallel play. We're not really working together right now but we are in the same space now it'd be up to the music therapist to use music in a way to probe and gradually interact into their space and then once we're on the same level of where they're comfortable then begin to branch out okay yeah so i guess it creates a level of comfortability exactly where i guess some people feel kind of private about music in a lot of ways or expressing themselves and so i think that's the best way to say it it's not even music but expressing uh your comfortability with even a stranger you know i'm just someone these kids have never met in their entire lives and it's like hey you're playing music with this person for 30 minutes yeah and truly don't know what to expect and that's why i really try to build off of relationship-based goals a lot, where as humans, we need to be able to have a shared dynamic in any way to be able to thrive together. Yeah. So where it's not like we have to have the share, same shared beliefs, but we need to be able to get on the same page with each other. So using music where we're very intimate in one way, where it's not just you're here and I'm there, but establishing a back and forth and then building out of that back and forth. Yeah, it's like having something in common with someone. Yes, exactly. And then being able to like branch off into a conversation about that. Exactly. And then you can expand the conversation towards other things. Yeah. Okay, I like that. You also talked about how, I guess, some kids with autism are more rigid in their structure. Yes. So I guess that'll move me into my next point of, uh, let's talk about music theory. Yeah, for sure. Because that has a more rigid structure to it while also being <laughs> flexible yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> um so why don't, why don't you give us a uh brief description in your words of what you describe as music theory music theory is essentially just the rules of what music quote-unquote should be but music theory as we know it today is also in a very western lens where it's based off of the classical music of europe and the associated music of that where there is music that's existed in many other east asian south asian cultures indigenous cultures the biggest thing is music's existed always there is no one right way or structured way to play music but a lot of what we know today is based off of that western music theory 
where it's our musical alphabet, where we don't use the entire alphabet. We use just seven letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And that's how we label our notes and how we read our music. And it's very abstract to a fault. Yeah. Because, yeah, we need the order. But also in music therapy, it comes to a point where it's like, well, I think any interaction that we do, even if non-musical, is valid. So in a way, music theory and music therapy almost butt heads. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. My thought of music theory from my little understanding of it has always been it's like learning the alphabet, like you said. Yes. But then like we learn the alphabet, we take it in our own direction, we write poetry, and then you have rhymes, slant rhymes, That's stuff a, like that's that. That's a fantastic analogy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like learning your alphabet with music theory and then taking it in your own direction. Absolutely. And kind of breaking the rules in a way. Like yeah. I think you brought up John Coltrane earlier. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Louis Armstrong. Um, they Ar- kind of... It was Armstrong, but I did it not was Coltrane. Armstrong. But that's okay. okay. If you got Coltrane on the mind, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, because I believe Coltrane did an interesting thing with breaking the yes. wheel of fifths. Yes, I'd love to talk about the, the circle of fifths, if that's okay. Yeah, go so right into it. The circle of fifths is essentially the blueprint for understanding music theory, at least how I see it. So it's a, it's a chart where it starts with C on top, and C is what we call an all-natural key. Every single note in it is applied just as the letter, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then back to C. And then as you go through the circle, certain things called sharps or flats get added. So just let me hope I can sing this right. If there's a note, ah, and if I went a little higher, ah, then it becomes sharp, and then ah, and it becomes flat. I don't think I exactly hit the notes I wanted to right there, but... An idea of it. An idea of it. And there's A, A sharp, A flat, and then C, C sharp, C flat, D, D sharp, D flat. There's var- variations off of the letters. And as we move through the circle, those variations build. Now, as you mentioned with John Coltrane in his uh, song Giant Steps, he sort of more followed not the actual structure of one part of the circle. He literally jumps between the circle. He drew lines from key to key to key which is when i say key it's called key signature the letters on the outside of the circle jumping from part to part to part to part to part where it's almost as if you're as you said making poetry yeah you're not reading a book from beginning to end you read the first page let's see what's on page 179 and now i'm gonna go to 33 and i'm really interested in what's the end of the book and somehow making that cohesive where in a way where it's like with poetry you know you're building a framework he's building a framework in a very abstract way but he has the vision of how to build it through it's, jazz is something else i can, I can tell you that yeah <laughs> makes me think of uh, quentin tarantino with pulp fiction how it's shot out of order yeah th- th- that's actually a great analogy for that <laughs> oh that's fantastic <laughs> so let's go into music theory is important we're working on a music therapy kit that should be in our library of things mm-hmm. uh if it's not at this point it will be soon so let's talk about like wh- where would you start people off learning music theory and then getting into music? Like you brought up as a kid getting started in like third grade. Yeah. But there's plenty of people who like never picked it up in school. Of course. So like where would your recommendation be to start for someone who, who knows, could be in their like 40s at mm. this point and want to pick up guitar for the first time? So it's funny... I think, depending on the instrument, you should start in different ways. So I'm going to go with guitar first. Guitar guitar players have a little bit of a notoriety for not knowing how to read music. <laughs> but at the same time, I don't blame them at all. Reading music for guitar is actually very complicated. So there's a few different ways to read guitar music. There's sheet music, chord charts, and tabs. And I actually recommend starting with tabs and chord charts. So a tab is, instead of seeing notes on a page, it tells you the numbered fret you're going to play with the guide of the string on the side. Now, you're not going to be learning the notes immediately off of that, but I actually think to get comfortable with learning the neck and where you should jump from spot to spot helps a lot. And then learning the open chords. There's like 
a dozen or so bread and butter open chords that once you get very comfortable with those, you could play a lot of songs. You, you don't realize how many songs are almost the same that you hear on the radio until you learn a few of the chords. Like, oh, I could play, I could play half of these now without even trying that much. Yeah, like how uh, the chord progression for "Don't Stop Believing" is used in everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so it's like the building blocks with that. And as far as I've known with music theory, it's good to start with kind of piano keys. That's where we're starting with our music theory kit. With theory, it 100% helps to think of it in piano terms first. So on piano, for people that don't know, uh, there's white and black keys. And whenever there's a white key, that's a natural note, or I will say it to a fault sometimes, a normal note, where we just call that just the letter. So it'll be C or G or F. And then a black key is where the alteration happens. Then you can call it sharp or flat if it's a black key. And for piano, that's the only way it can be ordered is a white key is natural, a black key is sharp or flat. Technically, it can be different. I don't play music where it's different, so you, you're probably good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for our music theory kit, our plan is if it's not out already, yeah. we have a sort of keyboard with each key labeled yeah so hopefully that'll help people start off we have music flashcards. Flashcards cards are, are fantastic for it as well oh and i'm sorry just to circle back i talked sure. about guitar but i think for any other instrument starting to learn in whatever staff that instrument plays so piano plays in a grand staff where one line is specifically for the right hand one line is specifically for the left hand okay and what exactly is a staff for people who wouldn't. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm jumping very ahead. A staff is just a, a grouping of lines and spaces. So all musical staffs are five lines and four spaces. And the notes that you would learn are either written in the spaces on the lines or above the staff or below the staff. Okay. And that sort of dictates what you're playing and how you're playing it. Okay. Not bad. So learning the staff for any instrument that you're starting out with, even if it's simple, is really good. Guitar can be tricky, though. Even still, I would say maybe learn the other stuff first for guitar. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know ideas we've had to add into our library things have been like ukuleles and yes. stuff like that. Yes. Do you have a recommendation, besides piano, what a good instrument to like learn music on would be? Well, piano, I think, is always fantastic. And... Guitar, as we said, ukulele would be really good too. I think I slide much more to a string bias, obviously. Yes. So, but I think any of the string instruments, just they're so beautiful. The finger patterns when you're first starting out, I feel like are very accessible. And the dexterity and strength that you build, it, like that helps for everyday life too, especially your fine motor skills. Awesome. So, like, that's going to bring me into my next question mm -hmm. too is. What basic skills do you think are required for, like, musicianship? I know it depends on each instrument of what is important, but yeah. what, what would you say are the basic building blocks? But before I get into that, I just want to say, for anyone who feels like there's a barrier for entry, please do not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate when people are so interested in an instrument, but they figure, oh, that's going to be too hard. I don't know if I can do that. Music is can be and will be for anybody and everybody and that's what matters most if you take away anything from this interview <laughs> music is for anyone and now i think when we're talking about a barrier a lot of times is how are your fingers especially when it comes to like piano and guitar but then when we're talking about band instruments which is admittedly something i'm not very well versed in uh, a lot of like arm flexion certain mouth movements which i was never good at at all you need to be able to make yeah. very specific uh sort of like framing on that uh, but but drums hey you just hit yeah. <laughs> and that's and that's always accessible too and that's a whole nother animal of truly because you don't read notes for drums the same way you would read yeah uh, any other pitched instrument granted there's also probably advantages to different body types and stuff absolutely like how absolutely. i said earlier with trombone because i'm yeah uh, they, they called you out because you had the long arms <laughs> yeah i'm very tall they told me i have piano playing fingers you so you have super long fingers yeah i have very long fingers yes which is also <laughs> why i play bass <laughs> so it, it truly is for everyone too because when i was in college i had a professor who 
she had to be five foot even. And I felt like when she was playing the cello, it looked too big for her. She was a lot better than me, though. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it, anyone can get into anything, truly. That's what I think matters the most. I'm, I'm sure that it can be accessible for anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I have one example, the band The Replacements. Yes. Yeah, older band, punk band. When they first started off, their bassist was 12 years old. I didn't know that. Yeah, everyone else in the band was in their, like, 18 to 20 range. <laughs> <laughs> and their bassist was 12. Just just a little mascot. <laughs> and to be honest, he's one of the better bassists I had like ever heard. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Stinson, if you ever look him up. Yeah, they just went on tour around the country with a 12-year-old on their bass. Oh my goodness. The Replacements have been hailed as one of the greatest cover bands of all time. Because <laughs> they would take stuff like prog rock and turn it into punk music. That is so cool. So they would play Roundabout at like double the speed and if anyone knows the bass line in that song it's hard to imagine a 12 year old playing that so i feel like anyone (laughs) can break in at any (laughs) age you do not have to be a giant to play bass you can be 12 years old and as we talked about before as well so reading music is still very important i think it's a good foundation but when it comes to stuff like bass, guitar, drums, if you even want to just throw a band together, there's still ways to learn it. Tabs are still an excellent resource. And I think there's no right way or wrong way to play music. Now, there's an analogy I liked a long time ago where it's sort of true and in a way sort of not. But my favorite thing is if you know how to play an instrument really well, but you don't know the music theory... It's almost like you're speaking perfect Spanish to someone, and you said, oh, I don't know what I'm saying, though. (laughs) But in a way, it almost doesn't matter if you don't know what you're saying with music. If you're in a context where you need to be a professional, I think, or if you just want to learn more, and you were generally curious about it, I think learning music theory is fantastic. But if you want to just pick up a bass or guitar or drums, piano, and you figured out what sounds good, power to you, and you that your enjoyment and your creation isn't less. Yeah, and there's plenty of people who just started out with guitar, fiddling around with it and finding what they liked. Yeah. And you don't even need like a rigid structure of a band where, as you said, most people have drummer, guitar, bass, vocals. A band can be pretty much anything. I know there's a band called You Bred Raptors where they have cello player, a guy who plays an eight-string bass, and a drummer. (laughs) And that's the band. That's that's a lineup. <laughs> yeah. So really, you can do anything and just kind of bring it together. And that's what I really like about music. And it's also why I think music theory is good, because mm-hmm. it gives you those building blocks to then take it in your own direction afterwards. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I guess we can start bringing this towards an end. Do you yeah, have sure. anything else to uh, add into this music theory discussion and music therapy? So I, I definitely think for music therapy, if you're interested, I would love for you to look up more, if not just for yourself, but just to learn what is it even deeper. I wish I could get into a lot longer today, but it's almost too hard to explain it in a way. <laughs> Understandable. So I love even anywhere, looking up videos, looking up books, even just Googling it, trying to get a little bit more information on what music therapy is. And that's another thing, too, is it's so much more accessible nowadays with the YouTube generation. Exactly. And we're we're really lucky in that regard. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of free resources all over the place for you to get started on your specific instrument. A a study tip, by the way, or an instrument tip for anyone, I found out a while ago and it helped me pass my board exam. If there's ever a topic you don't know, search it on YouTube. And that's actually the best way to study. (laughs) That's what helped me pass my board exam. Yeah. I mean, honestly, there's so many great creators out there just constantly giving out free lessons, free material. Just like at the Brentwood Local Library. At your local library, you can pick up a music theory kit. All right. So, Dan, thank you for being around here, coming in for this interview. Of course. Where can people find more about you or any of your work? So, admittedly, I'm not too online with my work. I know I'm a little far away from Brentwood, but I work through the New York Musician Center uh, in Nassau through our two locations in Belmore and Rockville Center. 
If you have any interest in learning more about music therapy, even not even to just work with me, but any resource you'd be interested in, my email is Sullivan, S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N, D-M-28 at gmail.com. All righty. So thank you again for being around, Dan. Of course. Thank you, And man. this has been Brentwood Stories. Are you interested in being interviewed on Brentwood Stories? Email adultprograms at brentwoodnylibrary.org for a chance to be featured on the podcast. That's adultprograms at brentwoodnylibrary.org.